Uh, hey guys, so I put up some supplement solutions, some solutions to the problems from the supplement. So you can see a link to it on the class webpage or on Triton Ed. So that way you guys can check your work, find out if, uh, if you guys have been doing those problems right or not. All right, I guess we can just get started. So today we are continuing on with strategies of integration. Okay, so this, this, this stuff really isn't very much that's new, so I'm kind of going to go through it kind of fast. And then we're going to get to some cooler stuff at the end of the lecture today. <clears throat> it's kind of just a, a review. So it, it's, it's, taking, it's what to do when you get an integral and you don't know which strategy to use. Because right, we've in all the previous sections in Chapter 7, we've learned all these different tricks so this, one, this section is kind of like, well, how do you know which trick to use on a given problem? And it's kind of a, um, I don't know, a, a tree diagram or a, 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 list, a, a list of steps to follow in order, where it's like, first try this. If that doesn't work, next try this. If that doesn't work, next try this. So I already did the very first thing to try, which is just simplify it algebraically. So I won't say any more about that. The, sec the second thing to do was the very first trick we used, which was a u substitution. And this is what I was on last time. So I'll continue talking. Basically, let me just give one more example of a u substitution where it might not be totally obvious how to do it. So all these examples that I'm doing are all kind of, I don't know, interesting or, or non-trivial, I should say. So they're probably all good questions to put on an exam, which I guess is coming up in like a week from Friday. Oh, so I got to start thinking about that too. OK, so here's an example. Let's try, what if? We had square roots inside of square roots. Oh, by the way, unrelatedly, are there some people in here who do not have ac access to the ebook? Huh? Because I thought it was included with WebAssign. That that disappoints me if that's true. I sent the email to WebAssign because I thought you guys should be able to get it. Really? But you're supposed to be able to like look, even when you do the problems, there are some parts where it's like you're supposed to be able to look at the part of the text that relates to that problem. You can't even look at that? <laughs> yeah, you guys could probably find a PDF. Don't tell, don't tell who makes our textbook. Pearson, Wiley, don't tell him I said that. Yeah. Uh, the web assign, uh, when you pay for it, the homework's 50 bucks, but the homework with the book, the ebook is 80 bucks. So. Really? Man. All right, well, I'm not. Uh, I think you guys, OK, let me, let me just put it this way. If you don't have the ebook or the PDF, should probably try and get it. Like the, the thought of going through this class without ever looking at the book, that's, that's not good. Don't, don't do that. <clears throat> All right. So back to this one. Let's do a sub. Uh, so I, I'm already telling you that we're going to do a substitution on this one. Just the, the point here is it might not be totally obvious what to do or uh, that, it'll e that it will even work. What do you guys think the substitution should be? Square root of x is a good choice. 
square root of x plus 1, I think, is an even better choice. You could do square root of x, but then you'd probably have to do a second substitution. Or maybe not. S sometimes these substitutions are also things that you can kind of do in your head once you've done a whole bunch of them. I'm going to try square root of x plus 1. That way I can basically just collect everything that's under the square root symbol here. So then du will be 1 over 2 root x dx. And we ran into a problem. Because we do not have this expression in our integral. Kind of like the last example that I did uh, at the end of class on Monday. Which means, so you got to engage in a bit of trickery here at this point. So if we solve this expression for dx, it's 2 root x times du. And using the expression for u, so you, you just kind of have to notice this. Root x is u minus 1. So if I replace root x with u minus 1, Sorry, 2. Yeah. So dx, replacing root x with u minus 1, I get that dx is 2 u minus 1 du. And the hope, you wouldn't know this beforehand, but the hope is that once we make all the substitutions, we then end up with an integral that we can do. Let's see what happens. OK, so this turns into u, and this turns into 2u minus 1 du. So I get 2u minus 1 du over root u. So was I successful in transforming it into an integral that we can do? Is this one doable, yes or no? Yeah, it is. All right, yeah, someone remembers. I, did, I actually did an example on Monday of a similar integrand like this, where the, the way to do it now is just divide uh, everything by root u. So this is the same as 2 root u minus 2 over root u, for example which you can integrate using just the power rule. OK, great. So <clears throat> that was the second trick that we've learned, the second thing to try to do to attack a given integral. If that still doesn't work, if you still can't figure it out, move on to our trick number three, integration by parts. And here's what to know about integration by parts. It's when to recognize when a problem is amenable to integration by parts. <clears throat> so the, the types of problems that work best for integration by parts are integrals of the form x to the n times some function of x dx. Let's say n is a uh, uh, non-negative integer. <laughs> Why are these so well suited for integration by parts? Because, OK, when we do integration by parts, B 
because the reason these guys work well is we set, what would our choice of, of u be in this integral? The x, the x term, yeah. This, this guy is what we're going to uh, set u to be. And why is that a good choice? Cause, yeah, because the powers go away. So you can just keep on repeating integration by parts until eventually all the x's are gone. And that's, that's the trick. You might have to do it more than, more than once. Like in this case, you would, it looks like you would probably have to do it n times. So yeah, it's an example of repeated integration by parts. So if your u is x to the n, so d, du is n x to the n minus, minus 1 dx has lesser powers of x. Does this encapsulate all the problems that were, in, that were good for integration by parts? Can anyone think of any that were not of this form? Yeah, so some notable exceptions. Okay, so maybe I should just say positive integer here. So you could say if it's, so let's say positive. So that, so that way uh, ln is actually an exception. Right, because if, if I said non-negative, that means you could allow n equals 0, which is just, well, every integral has x to the 0 in front of it including ln. So the integral of ln x dx, what you do is you just kind of mentally insert uh, a 1 right here. And then you think of, of that as your dv. <coughs> what, are, are there any other exceptions that anyone can think of? I, I had to look this up. I didn't know off the top of my head, but there are some other ones. I'd be impressed if anyone actually knew. So uh, sine inverse and tan inverse both actually are other, good, are other uh, exceptions. So, for example, the way that we would do sine inverse is, here's how I would do sine inverse, is I would set y equal to sine inverse of x. So x is the sine of y. dx is cos y dy. And then the integral, OK, so this I'm going to plug in for dx and this is my y. So I get the integral of y times cos y dy. And now it looks like a good candidate for integration by parts. I thought maybe I'd, I'd show you an example of what, hap what happens when it's a, it's a very typical example of one of these types of problems, one of these types of integration by parts problems. And let's just do it really fast using that, um, oh, what's the name of the turbo method with the columns? Tabular. Tabular? Is that what someone said? Yes. Tabular? Yes. The chart, right? The chart, yeah. OK, so let's do, how about? x to the third e to the 2x dx using the chart 
or tabular shortcut. And if you haven't seen this before, don't, don't know how it works, you can probably pick up on it here by just watching me. And if not, then go and look up some examples of it and you can probably figure it out. It's not that hard. The way you do it is, so as usual, we're gonna set this equal to u and this will be dv and then you make a column where this is the, the u column and this is the, well these are the u's here, I put d, I'll put u right here and I'll put dv here. So u is x to the third, dv is e to the 2x. And on the left side, go down taking derivatives. So I'll get a 3x squared, a 6x, a 6, and a 0. On the right side, you take antiderivatives instead of derivatives. So it's like the opposite of what I did on the left side. So on this side, you derivate. On this side, you anti derivate. So the antiderivative of e to the 2x is 1 half e to the 2x, 1 fourth e to the 2x, 1 eighth e to the 2x, 1 sixteenth e to the 2x. And that's all I'm going to need. And now, so th this is probably the most complicated part of this, is you do this times this with a plus sign. This times this with a minus sign. This times this with a plus sign. This times this with a minus sign. Which gives me x cubed times 1 half e to the 2x, because the first one has the plus sign, minus 3x squared times 1 fourth e to the 2x, then back to plus 6x times 1 eighth e to the 2x, and then minus 6 times 1 16th e to the 2x, and then plus c. So pretty fast way to get such a long answer. Like, Can you imagine how long it would have taken to do this by hand if we had done each integration by parts individually? Pretty freaking fast, right? Yeah. Is this in the textbook? I didn't see it in the textbook. Good question. Has anyone seen this method in the textbook? No. Okay. Yeah, I guess not. I don't remember seeing it. Um, I think Madura said she might have. She talked about it in discussion. Is that anyone remember that? Yes. So you'll notice it only works if I eventually get a 0 right here. Right? Like I could have kept going, and the next term it would have been 0 times the next term, which is just 0. So that's why I was able to stop once I got a 0 here. If you never got a 0 there, then you'd never be able to stop doing this. So I will, in fact, look, I'll show you as an example right now where that's where you will not ever get a zero. So how about this one? Some of you guys might recognize. How about e to the x sine x dx? Does anyone remember this one? Yeah, well, so, OK, if, if we try and do it here, like, let's say I just I decided to set up here, let's, let's call, let's say this sine x is, uh, is u, and e to the x is dv. So we'll just get sine x, cos x, negative sine x, negative cos x, sine x. Wait a second. This one's never going to stop. And then e to the x, e to the x, e to the x, e to the x. It never stops, right? It just keeps on going. So you'd be like, hmm, well, that's not so great. Yeah? So using this, do you basically take a lot of and that would be zero? 
Do I base choosing you off what? Yes, that, that's usually the good idea. Right, that's why that's, that was my choice of you here. In this case, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, like I could have switched these two and they still would never disappear. You might notice, um, yeah, Robert? Yep. So does that mean um, for that, would any terms like cancel out? Um, just like a quick fun question. Could I eat the X on of X? Like, well, going on forever, maybe like how most of them were canceled out. Yeah, like it was like an infinite. Um, no, we're going to have to do another trick. Um, so I'll show you the way to do this one. It's going to, you have to have integrals on the right hand side. So I'll show you in a second and then you'll see what I mean. And I also wanted to say, if we had switched U and V, it wouldn't have mattered here. Sometimes, some of you guys might have discovered this. Like, let's say you try to do some integration by parts problem. You pick your U, you pick your V, you do it once, you realize, damn, I got to do it a second time. And then you, you pick a, a different choice of U and V, and you just end up like back at the original integral. So if you, if you are not consistent with your choice of U and V, it's like you just end up accidentally undoing all the work that you just did. So you could do all this work and end up back to the totally original integral that you started with. So that's, that's why it, you kind of have to continue with all the X's being the U's and the exponentials being the DV's. I, I, wouldn't, I don't know if anyone accidentally did that, trying to do a homework problem, but it's kind of a funny waste of time. So if I try to, okay, so let's see what happens on this one. I'll just, I'll make a choice of U, a choice of V, and be consistent with it. So here, let's just set, it doesn't really matter. Let's set this one to U and this one to DV. Okay, so which means that V was apparently, what, negative cosine of X. Okay, and du is e to the x dx. <clears throat> so I will get negative cos x times e to the x, and then minus minus plus v du cos x times e to the x. And I'm going to try to do it again. Right? It doesn't look like things got that much better, but once again, I'm going to keep the e to the x as the u. Okay, so du is still e to the x. Cosine, that will be my dv, which means v was sine. So I will get negative cos x e to the x plus, okay, so u times v is e to the x times sine of x minus the integral of v du sine x times e to the x so what just happened here Let me write this all out in one line if you don't see it. The integral of e to the x times sine x ends up equaling negative cos x times e to the x plus sine x times e to the x minus the integral of e to the x times sine x the x. So it doesn't look like things are getting better, right? Like, I still have an integral on the right-hand side. What, what can I do? 
this, I could keep on doing this, it's not going to make it, things any better, but did anyone notice? Not only do I still have an integral on the right-hand side, it's the same integral I have on the left-hand side. And they don't cancel out either, right? Because I was consistent with my, with my choice of the exponential always being the u. So let's just add this term to both sides. All right, so let's plus e to the x sine x dx and plus e to the x sine x dx. So now I have 2 times the integral of e to the x sine x dx. On the right-hand side, they cancel. For some reason, I like canceling stuff in red, but I'll use purple. So on the right-hand side, uh, these, those two terms cancel, and we're just left with these two, which I could factor out an e to the x of. So let's just divide everything by 2. And I got an answer. I guess I should put a plus C. Yeah, so it, it's kind of a, a neat trick there, our happy accident, that we were able to magically end up with the integral that we were trying to solve for on the right side of the equation. And then we move it over to the left side, combine the terms, and that allows us to get an answer. So yeah, this is kind of a, another cool, neat trick, which I don't know if you guys have seen before. OK, so that's all I wanted to say about integration by parts. If you've tried to integrate by parts and that still doesn't work, the next thing you can do is uh, if, you're, if your integral is in the form of a trig integral, right, which is like sine to the n of x, cos to the m of x, or we've also had ones where it was powers of tan and secant, then we already learned methods for attacking these guys. I'm not going to go over those again now, but that was back in whatever section that was. Right? Sometimes you'll be combining these methods, like you'll do a substitution that will transform your integral into one of these forms. So that would be the next thing to look for or to try. And if that still doesn't help, help with things, the next thing to look for is not quite the same as trig integrals, but trig substitution. Where, if you guys recall, if you had, let's see, a squared minus x squared, let x be a sine theta, a squared plus x squared, let x equal a tan theta, and x squared minus a squared is a secant substitution. Again, I'm not going to go over this again because we just did this stuff. I'm just pointing out that's sort of the next thing that you want to try implementing. Let's see, do we have any more? What do, do we? Oh yeah, okay. We also, uh, if, if they are rational functions, then what we learned in the section on rational functions was to first long divide, and then do a partial fraction decomposition. So again, I'm not going to do this right now, because we, we just learned this stuff a few days ago. And then, let's see, there's a couple other tools at your disposal that are, I don't know, kind of numerical, or kind of cheating. So, uh, another one would be to use a table. Or
or a, a computer algebra system like uh, MATLAB or Mathematica or Maple or Wolfram. Now, as, as engineers, you, a lot of you guys are probably going to be doing this one a lot. But this is a math class, not an engineering class. And I personally find this stuff like really tedious. Like the whole, I probably could have gotten a good job by going into engineering, and, but <clears throat> I hated like actually having to get my hands dirty with actual numbers. You know, I, would, I always thought that the, the theory was a lot more interesting. That's why I went into pure math. To this day, I've never taken an, an applied math class in my life. Um, or even an engineering class, but I imagine that this is probably what you guys would be doing in engineering, but that's in engineering, this is math, so in math we're going to do the cool stuff. We're going to do the theory here, and you guys <clears throat> can probably get practice with this stuff in an engineering class, and it's really not that hard. Mainly, what I want to point out now is just to know that it's out there and that it exists. So, you guys should look at the inside of your textbook, which you all should have, and see a table, a table of integrals. It's actually on the back page. The last, like, three pages of the textbook are a giant table of integrals of all these different formulas for the various different types of situations that might come up. So, it's good to, to just know how to be able to find your integral on that list and plug and chug and pump out an answer. Okay, so that's all that I want to say about that. So now let's, let's get into something a bit more interesting. Okay, how many, let's, what the freak is this dude's name? Hafthar Bjornsson. How many of you know who Hafthar Bjornsson is? You know? Yeah, I think it's a different person. Though. Okay. <laughs> Do you watch Game of Thrones? That's him. Oh yeah. That's freaking dude. Yes, dude. Yeah. Talking about the mountain. Sick. Sander Clegane, dude, is the mountain on Game of Thrones. Do you guys? Okay, I didn't know who Hafthar Bjornsson was, but of course I know who the mountain is, right? Do you guys know who Sander Clegane is on Game of Thrones? Oh, sick. All right. So. Um, for those of you who don't watch Game of Thrones, what are you doing with your life? And <laughs> you should watch it. And the mountain is one of the characters in it. He's huge. He's, he's a total badass. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he, just, uh, he was just in the news, actually. So I, I just heard about this yesterday. Was the actor that plays uh, Sander Clegane on Game of Thrones, which, by the way, I read all the books before the series even came out. Just FYI. Um, so, I, I did. so the actor, uh, this, I'm just going to call him Sander, okay, because his real name's too hard. Or the mountain. I'll just call him the mountain. So the actor that plays the mountain was just in the news because he just won the world's strongest man competition. Dude is six feet nine inches tall. He weighs 400 pounds. And he just won the World Strongman competition by, among other things, he lifted up a barbell with, guess how many pounds? Over a thousand, okay? Like a, a thousand and forty or something like that. He could lift this whole front row like no problem. Yeah, e easily. He could lift one, two, three, four, or five, you, you six. Could probably lift some cars. Like, it's crazy. And to think, the dude is 6'9", and he had to lift it all the way from the ground up to, you know, 6 feet 9 inches in the air. I thought, man, like, that's got to be a lot of work. Work. I started thinking about work. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, a, that's a math concept. Well, it's a physics concept. And... And it has a mathematical definition, which I haven't really talked about in this class. Um, I actually, I, I skipped the section on work and energy, 
but I wasn't happy about it. Like I, if I, if I had all the time in the world, I would have included that section definitely in this class because it's important, especially for engineers and physicists. So let me at least you know, be able to say that I told you guys about it. So the most basic definition of work, and by the way, work uh, is work and energy. Let, let's start with that. What's the difference between work and energy? So yeah, I'm talking about the rigorous physical definition, the physics definition of the word work. We don't mean like, you know, having a, a job that you go to all day. We're talking about in physics or thermodynamics, when they use the word work, they are referring to expenditure of energy, okay? So it requires energy to do work. Work and energy have the same units. They're basically the same thing. So, right, there's multiple different types of energy, right? There's like thermal energy, there's kinetic energy, there's uh, electrical energy, there's potential energy. And work is one of the forms of energy. It's what happens when you physically push something or pull something. Every object um, that is in motion or is accelerated is having work done on it or is doing work on something else. So the formula for work, the most basic formula for work, Let's, let's, call it, let's call it W, is it's force times distance. So this is the applied force. This is the, or actually, let's say displacement. So naturally, I asked the question was, how much work did, did the mountain do in picking up this barbell? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> let's just say it was a thousand pounds. And he's six foot nine, and he lifted it up to his head, six feet nine inches, which is the same as 6.75 feet. So according to the formula, he did, so uh, the force, by the way, uh, the number of pounds that something weighs, that's, that's a force. Right? Pounds, a lot of people confuse pound, uh, your weight with your mass. Your pounds is your weight, which refers to the force that you're being pulled to the, to the floor with. So if you go to the moon, right, you won't weigh the same number of pounds, even though your mass will be the same. So this is a 1,000-pound a, a force. <coughs> and so he did 1,000 pounds of force over a... 6.75 foot distance, expending 6,750 foot pounds of energy. Okay, fine. That's a ridiculous amount. Like, I'm I'm probably not going to do that in the gym all week. <laughs> if I went to the gym, so. <clears throat> Uh, now, now, I want to change the question up a little bit and imagine, so like, the, I, the mountain is pretty tall. He's six foot nine. He's six feet and nine inches tall. Let's imagine that he was 4,000 miles tall instead. That's my next question.
Any idea why I chose that number? So Mount Everest is like seven miles tall. It, I don't know. I don't think it's, uh, <laughs> it's way, it, this has to be way taller than anything. So this is like the radius of the Earth, actually. Yeah, so it's like if, if this is the Earth, then he's as tall as the, well, he's as tall as the radius of the, there. So there, he's holding the, the, the barbell, right? OK, so there's <clears throat> the radius of the Earth is about 4,000 miles. And he's also about 4,000 miles. So I wanted to see how much work it would be if he lifted the weight now, now that he's 4,000 miles tall. Uh, 4,000 miles, by the way, is approximately 20 million uh, feet. But, so can I use, here's the question now, can I just use the, the same formula? Right, so, so then the work, it'll just be, um, what is it, a thousand pounds times, uh, let's, oh this, sorry, this is feet, times 20 million feet. Is this, will this be the work? So this is, I'm asking you a physics question right now. Yeah, Aiden. You have to integrate the changing gravity because it's so drastic. Oh, so he's saying, wait, but gravity changes, right? Like, I, as I was saying before, we, we have a certain weight uh, on the surface of the Earth, but if we were to go to the moon, we would weigh something different, and certainly, if we were twice as far from the center of the Earth, we would expect to weigh less, right? So that's exactly the point, is the, the weight, the, 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 the barbell, it won't weigh as much when it's 4,000 miles from the surface of the Earth. Anyone know what fraction of its weight it will be? A quarter is correct, yes. Uh, so the, it will actually only weigh, at this point, it will now weigh uh, 250 pounds, which is one quarter of a thousand. And where did, did we get that one quarter factor from? Yeah? Inverse the inverse square law is, is right. So. Uh, one of the things that Newton put his name on, in addition to most of the things that you guys have learned in this class, is his law of universal gravitation. So this is just uh, FYI. I'm not really going to test you on this formula, but it's relevant to what I'm about to tell you. So it gives a formula for the force between two massive objects. It's the product of their masses divided by the, the distance between them squared. Of masses M1, M2 at a distance R apart. Okay, I'm not, I'm not really going to get too much into that, but what I just wanted to point out was the fact, was the key fact. All I really care about for the purpose of this problem was the two right here. The fact that if you made two objects twice as far apart, that factor of two would get squared and would actually cut into force the force between the object, okay? So if you pulled them, you know, three times as far away, then you would only have one-ninth of the attractive force between them. It's, it's a crucial, like, 
You have no idea how much of nature was dependent on the fact of, that this is an inverse square law. It's also super related to uh, electricity and magnetism because charges have the same law of, of attraction. Uh, the, the force between two charged particles also varies as the inverse square of their distance, which is actually fundamentally related to the research that I'm doing to get, to get my PhD and write my thesis. I'm working with Coulomb attractions all day. Um, but let, let's examine some of the consequences of that. So using that, I can give you guys a different formula for what the, the weight of the barbell is going to be that will now vary with the height of the barbell above the surface of the Earth. So the weight, let's say here, here's the Earth. Let's say this is the radius of the Earth is R, where I told you R was 4,000 miles, or 20 times 10 to the sixth feet. That's the radius of the Earth. And let's say we're at a height uh, let's say H. So if if you're if the barbell is out here, and this is a height H equals your height above the surface, then your new weight it's going to be one thousand times R over R plus H squared. So you can see if you if you plug in H equals R, which was the situation that I drew over here. Then that corresponds to a weight of well, it'll be one thousand times R over. 2r squared, which is 1,000 times 1 half squared, which is 250. So this formula gives the right weight, uh, at least according to what we'd already said. <clears throat> OK. So <clears throat> really, if we want to calculate uh, the, the work required to lift this barbell, we're going to have to integrate it. We can no longer use the formula over here, F times D, because the force is going to vary with the distance. So <clears throat> so <clears throat> here, let me, in fact, let me give you the, the new formula for work. This formula will become, let me write it like this, it will be the integral of force of x dx for a force that varies with distance. So in this case, it will be the integral of 1,000 times r over r plus h squared. <clears throat> and my, I was using h. Maybe I should use x here. Let's call it x instead of h. Here, let's use the letter x. The x as x goes from 0 up to uh, h. OK? So I can do this integral really fast. It's 1,000 r squared times negative 1 over r plus x as x goes from 0 to h. So I get 1,000 r squared. Let's see, that's a 1 over r minus 1 over r plus h. OK, 
So I could put in h equals 2r for h equals r, sorry, and see how much work it required to lift the barbell up to this. But that's not actually the point of this whole example. Because I said that the mountain was 4,000 miles tall. Well, why stop there? Well, how about uh, 4 billion miles tall? Or 4 trillion miles tall? You see where I'm going with this? What do I really want to know is how much work would it take to, to lift this barbell off the surface of the Earth and carry it out to the farthest reaches of the galaxy? Basically, off to infinity, right? So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to see what happens to this quantity if, if I let the height go to infinity. Well, in fact, we can see right now, what does this quantity go to if I let the height go off to infinity? This term just goes away as h goes to infinity. And the whole answer I'm left with is 1,000 times r. And what I just did was an example of the next subject of this class, section 7.7. .7. This is a so-called improper integral. This was, what I just did was the integral from zero to infinity of this quantity. So I will have to pick that up on Friday, and now you see why we're doing it.